Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. We've been sort of involved with the organization of this meeting for some time, and it's exciting to actually be here now to, uh, to sort of contribute to the process. I'm wearing several different hats at this meeting. The first is, is as a novice rebreather diver. We just recently completed some training in the, in the use of rebreathers for our, for our program in the last few weeks and months. I'm also here wearing the hat of a, of a scientific diving safety officer for a large academic program. And, uh, and lastly, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the American Academy of Underwater Sciences. We'll talk a little bit about what that organization is and does in just a few minutes as their immediate past president. So it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to sort of uh, take this opportunity to learn from all of you uh, as we move forward through this process. Scientific diving, it's sort of important to st sort of start off at a baseline. Uh, scientific diving is subject to occupational health and safety regulations. We have a partial exemption from the OSHA commercial diving standards, but it pertains to diving that is specifically considered by OSHA scientific diving. And in this case, it's diving that is performed solely as a necessary part of a scientific research or educational activity by employees whose sole purpose for diving is to perform scientific research tax tasks. That's the context within which we work. The American Academy of Underwater Sciences, and, and again, I should preface all of this stuff, that I'm, I'm honestly speaking from the perspective of the AAUS. There are a variety of scientific diving organizations, federal organizations, nonprofits, that do, in fact, in industry, in fact, that do conduct scientific diving operations utilizing CCR, but really my perspective is that from the AAUS. The AAUS is an organization of organizations. It was initially formalized in 1982 in response to OSHA's implementation of commercial diving standards. Uh, it would have had dramatic implications to the way uh, our academic institutions and scientists conduct, conduct business. And so we were organized basically to provide context to the self-regulation that we've provided for many years and, to, and were granted a bit of an exemption from the, the commercial diving standards. The mission of the AAUS is to facilitate the development of safe and productive scientific divers through education, research, advocacy, and the advancement of standards for scientific diving practices, certifications, and organizations. Sort of our product and our sort of benefit of membership really is our standards and the ease of working relationships that are established between organizational members. That's, that's really sort of what we provide and, and really what the benefit of the organization is. We currently stand at 136 organizational members, uh, representing more than 4,700 uh, individual divers. And in 2007, we conducted uh, over 128,000 dives annually. So it, it's not an insignificant data set. We've, our community has recognized for, for many, many years, as have a variety of folks here, that, that the rebreather is, is a powerful tool to have in our toolbox. Uh, our scientists are in the business of making observations and collecting data underwater. This is a really powerful and useful tool under certain, certain circumstances to allow them to do that. That being said, I think we could all agree that the, the current technology requires quite a lot of attention to detail and monitoring of complex, sometimes complex, life support equipment in order to maintain that, the safety of the individual diver. And that may detract, and in some cases can, does detract from the sole purpose of the dive mission, which is for our scientists to make scientific observations and data collections. And our scientists are not necessarily credited for their time spent training and for their time spent on pre-dive and post-dive equipment maintenance and checklists. So in some ways, the time necessary to be proficient and, and safe using CCR is a little counter to the general community the general scientific diving community, the broad scientific diving community. But we clearly recognize that there's value in, in, in deeper, more exploratory, more, uh, more advanced diving operations for the variety of reasons that we've already heard about today. Powerful tool for extended range and technical scientific diving. Uh, some of our members are actually are, are absolutely involved in that process. But I'd like to make the point that it's potentially an extraordinarily p powerful uh, tool for extending bottom time and potentially scientific productivity in the non-technical depths, in 100 feet of water or less, where we can really extend our, our time on the bottom, allowing our scientists to get potentially more work done. And, and uh, we, we looked, uh, we saw the logistic constraints of, of remote site and, and particularly deep technical diving 
with respect to uh, infrastructure logistics. Our community does work remotely frequently in, in the reduced footprint and logistics requirements that CCR provides is very, very attractive to, attractive to us. Michael spoke a little bit about the, sort of the historical use of CCR and development of CCR. The Stark Electro-Lung Rebreather was developed uh, actually in collaboration with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution scientists and some work that was being conducted at Harbor Branch. Sylvia Earle and her colleagues used Mark 10 Mod 3 made by GE for the work in their Tektite 2 saturation mission. Gene Melton shared with, uh, shared with me some information and some stories about some Harbor Branch work that was conducted in the 70s using CCR 1000s and obviously the work that Dr. Stone and, and, and Rich Pyle have put together with the Cislunars and a lot of the early uh, and ongoing research that they're contributing to uh, has been of significant value. We are, our community is applying the technology in a variety of ways. Uh, there's advantages in data being collected, looking at behavioral observations, fish assessments, and particularly fish, fish bioacoustics. The quiet nature of the rebreather is helpful in recording the, the subtle sounds that fish make. Um, I'm implementing a marine ecology program, or implementing CCR in support of a marine ecology program at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography right now. Um, lots of work conducted archaeologically. Whether or not it's appropriate or, or, or terribly fair, I've heard pretty, pretty, uh, pretty positive uh, reports back that uh, CCR is helpful for fish collections. <laughs> they don't see or hear you coming to a certain extent. And here on the bottom left uh, photo here, you see, uh, see uh, one of the uh, applications that we've used for many years. That's a UC Santa Cruz and California Department of Fish and Game scientists using oxygen rebreathers to sneak up and capture sea otters in the Aleutian Islands. So it's a powerful tool for letting them capture sea otters to do tag and monitoring of those populations. We've talked a little bit about and we'll probably talk in great detail about the cave and mesophotic, or mesophotic zone work that, that these things provide an opportunity to study. And I do have some colleagues that are recently trying to use rebreathers to, to study the, the underside of ice uh, that are, you know, that environment and that boundary layer is, is pretty dramatically impacted by bubbles. So we are, in fact, putting CCR to a pretty broad application in our program, in our community. We're just not doing a lot of it. In 2007, we had 71 divers from 20 organizational members reporting use of CCR. 1,236 dives. I mean, we could see here that there has been gradual growth over the years, but it, it's grown from very small to still a very limited component of what our community actually does. Uh, when you compare that to our summary statistics for the same year, we had 124 organizational members reporting that they were, uh, that they were supporting 4,769 divers conducting 128,502 dives. So the take home here is we see the potential, we're using it to, to, a, to a certain extent, but it still comprises less than 1% of the total number of dives the AAUS scientific diving community conducts every year. And if you compare the CCR statistics to to our sort of comparable use of required decompression and mixed gas, you can see that uh, really the take home here is, is by and large we're not doing terribly deep work. The vast, vast majority of our work is in 100 feet of water or less. So a little bit more about sort of what the AAUS produces. I, I'm, we don't have time to go through this, the AAUS consensual standards, but you're welcome to go to our website, aaus.org, take a look around. And, and kind of get a sense of, of sort of our, our, how the standards dictate or provide guidelines for program management, diver training, and operational procedures and guidelines for the typical average scientific diver. For those of us who, who are engaged in deeper work, we have standards for stage decompression, mixed gas, and CCR, and specific, or rebreather specifically, we detail further training requirements, equipment selection criteria, and operational policies and procedures that pertain specifically to rebreathers. In addition to completing a 100-hour scientific diving course stipulated in the AUS standards, some of the prerequisites required for those wishing to use CCR are rebreathers include 50 open water dives, a 100-foot depth authorization. Our community uh, has established protocols or standards to, 
to measure, to allow our divers to progressively work de deeper and deeper in a measured progression so that we ensure that they have an appropriate amount of experience before getting into deeper, deeper water. And obviously, in order to effectively use a closed circuit rebreather, you should have a pretty firm understanding of nitrox. I think our training standards uh, are relatively closely or relatively similar to the technical diving training world. We need to spend, for closed circuit rebreathers, we need to spend a, a good deal of time in a pool. Eight training dives totaling 380 minutes. What we do overlay that's a little different, I believe, is our requirement for supervised dives beyond that to, to build more experience into our scientists before they go out and conduct their own work. Our standards are minimal standards, and, and I think that in many cases we, we can take opportunity to sort of build on them at, at an institutional, organizational member level. Our approach recently has been to sort of increase the amount of, of time and experience that scientists need to have before going out and using the technology to actually collect data. We've increased that to 50 total hours, which I think some of our scientists felt was a little, was a little uh, excessive until, until we um, until we reached that 35, 40 hour point and they realized how much more they actually have to learn. We're firm believers in oversight. Diving safety officer or appropriate de de designee should be on site, at least initially in our community, to ensure not only, to ensure that the divers are in fact completing the checklist, conducting themselves according to standard and in a safe manner, when they start becoming a little more distracted by their mission, which is ultimately to collect their data and do their science. And with our independent organizational standards, as well as the AAUS standards, periodic review and revision of these standards, is, these are living documents. We wish to evolve them as, as technology develops and our experience develops with this technology. Our standards stipulate equipment selection criteria, recognized quality assurance, quality control protocols uh, should be in place for the manufacturers, third-party testing and evaluation by the, the players that we heard about earlier. I think RISA is going to be really helpful in this process in evaluating the rebreathers that might be most appropriate for our users. And then we have overlaid additional operational policy and procedures specific to scientific diving or to uh, rebreather diving, including sort of how to deal with mixed buddy pairs, buddy qualifications, oxygen exposure limits, decompression management strategies, Required and archived maintenance logs, pre and post dive checklists, bailout strategies, carbon dioxide scrubber duration um, limits, and, and disinfectant protocols. So all of our standards are sort of built to, to in, ensure, to better ensure that, that our divers are using these things appropriately and safely. From a program standpoint of implementing these things, I think that we should be thinking a little bit about standardization programmatically to make training and maintenance issues more efficient and to better provide opportunity to maintain the skills and proficiency necessary for these researchers to be effective in the field. The importance of manufacturer support cannot be overstated. It's really important for us to be able to, to call up a manufacturer and get a near immediate response in order to keep our, our activities going in the field. And we as diving program managers and diving officers have a lot of responsibility to select the proper diver to ensure that the divers that are sort of authorized and trained to use CCR are appropriate. These are, this is not a tool that's gonna to be effective for all of our divers uh, in our scientific diving communities. Nowhere near as bulletproof is, is sort of the open circuit scuba that, that our broad experience, um, where is, which is where most of our broad experience is. Looking forward, the scientific diving community is not really restricted by uh, OSHA with respect to technology. We are free to, to use the best technology available in order to support our scientists to get their work done. We look forward to an opportunity to, do, to work with uh, the manufacturers and with the training agencies and within our own community to design and implement standard operating procedures for, for our community looking forward. But, but we have to realize what, what our community does realize is that we're working in, in almost a, uh, we have almost zero tolerance for, for risk in the institutional academic setting at this point. So when we approach these, these technologies and application of these technologies, we have to do so recognizing that, that uh, we have to do these, we have to apply these things as effectively as possible because we really do, we have very limited tolerance for risk in the academic setting. If we were to, to sort of integrate uh, CCR technology as they become more, more readily available and more affordable, some of the considerations that, that we have would, 
would be obviously cost reduction. That's a double-edged sword, as we heard earlier today. The cheaper they get, the more available they are to a larger audience. Cost is still a consideration for some of our users, some of our, some of our scientists, but it's not necessarily overwhelming if the science mission is warranted. The funding is available to pick up the cost of these things as appropriate. We do wish to encourage simple, not so much simplified engineering, but less complex user interfaces. We want to make these things as straightforward and as robust as possible and as simple for the user as is possible. Commensurate with that is, is we would hope reduce training requirements. We have a very transient community of, of graduate students and, and young scientists that, that stay in the community for a short period of time. And there really is not a huge amount of value for the seasoned scientist to make the investment in time and training that's appropriate for the use of the technology. Reduce prep and maintenance requirements, and particularly for remote field site work, a smaller, lighter package is desirable. But we cannot compromise our evaluation and selection of the user based on aptitude and discipline. We need to ensure that, that we're vetting and verifying and qualifying our divers to the appropriate standard. Following up upon this meeting, we'll take the proceedings or the publications that we receive from this exercise to our annual symposium in Monterey in September and conduct a workshop that would see how we can integrate the findings from this meeting into our scientific diving community, evolve our standards as appropriate. And we definitely, as the, as the market expands, as the number of, or number of units on the market sort of grows, we as a community need to work on um, sort of unit-specific training modules maintenance requirements and strategies for, for keeping our divers trained and their skills high throughout time. So I would like to thank the AUS for sort of co-convening this meeting with Dan and Patty, and thank you very much.